I'm Kim Kirk sharing 10 things I learned from Peter. We're on number seven, and here's what we've seen so far. God gives us what we need to do what he calls us to do. Outcome doesn't always reflect effort. A perceived failure can actually be a great success. Even though we don't have it all together, God can speak through us. We don't know better than Jesus. Sometimes we just need to be silent. And the seventh, don't judge by appearances. One thing I like about Peter is that most of the time, what you see is what you get, but not always. There's two instances near the end of Christ's earthly life where we tend to jump to a quick but wrong conclusion about him. The first is found in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus invited those closest to him, Peter, James, and John, to come into the garden and to pray for him. He then sort of parted from them and spent that time with his heavenly father. But before that, he told them that his soul was so sorrowful, even to the point of death. And he asked them to pray for him. We know that time in the garden was agonizing for Jesus and distressing, so much so that Luke's account tells us that he actually sweat drops of blood. So what were Peter and the others doing? Were they fervently praying for their Lord? Not according to Matthew 26, verse 40. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, so you could not watch with me one hour? This happened three times. And we might think, seriously? What was their problem? Didn't they care? Luke tells us that that was not the case. Luke 22, verse 45. When he rose from prayer and went back to his disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. It wasn't that they didn't care enough. It was that they cared too much and it was just all too much for them to handle. We all know and have experienced that emotional stress is even more exhausting than physical toil. I believe there's another reason why they weren't there for Christ in this moment because it was a time when he had to face what he was facing alone, just he and his heavenly father. The second example comes soon after the garden. We know that Jesus, after the Passover meal, he told all of his disciples that all of them would fall away and says that Peter will deny him. We read about this in Matthew 26 verses 33 to 35. Peter answered, though all will fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus said to him, truly I tell you this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same. Now, we probably know that Jesus told Peter he would deny him and that Peter said it wouldn't happen. But do we realize or maybe remember that all the other disciples said the same thing? Peter wasn't the only one. He was just the most vocal. And only he and John, after all of them fell, to, fell away when Jesus was, was arrested, which was prophesied, only he and John doubled back and followed closely to see what happened to Jesus. That's what put Peter in the position to be asked about his relationship with the Lord and deny him. Now, I'm not saying that that makes it okay, but it gives us the context that shows, gives us a clear picture of that darkest hour in this disciple's life and his great love for Jesus that caused him to put himself at great risk. It's easy to jump to conclusions about others, and we do that with Peter, and yet we see that, that things are not always as they appear to be. So these examples hopefully will remind us not to judge others by appearances. Well, there's only three left on our list, so be sure to come back tomorrow. And as always, if you've missed any, you can find them on my website or my YouTube page.